Welcome to this mock application, which is designed to illustrate the SCL adjudication scheme. For those of you unfamiliar with the scheme, it's a quick fire three month maximum procedure for the resolution of technology disputes. Any dispute arising from a contract for the provision of tech related goods or services, that might be um, software development contracts, outsourcing agreements, system integration contracts, IT consultancy contracts, software licensing agreements, blockchain, smart contracts, cloud computing, uh, pretty much anything which falls within the broad scope of the concept of technology, you can use this scheme to adjudicate. Now, we have a scenario for you today, which involves a software licensing agreement. And we are going to follow the dispute as it progresses from beginning to the end under the scheme. And in doing so, we'll demonstrate the key features of the scheme and what it offers uh, to those who have disputes. I'll be offering commentary with uh, Simon Henderson, who is a member of the panel of adjudicators of the scheme. As for the cost for the scenario itself, Terence Bergen, Queen's Council, acts as the adjudicator. Ian Munro represents the claimant, and Laura Wright represents the respondent. The scheme is the result of considerable work of an SEL drafting committee, which included Matthew. And in the course of this talk, we'll touch on many of the key features of the scheme. But before turning to the SCL scheme itself, I'd like to say a few words about the history of adjudication in the construction industry, since it's that procedure which has inspired the SCL scheme. Construction adjudication was introduced by a 1996 Act of Parliament, which was naturally entitled the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act. The preamble to the Act refers to making provision for housing grants and the like, and doesn't even mention adjudication. But tucked away in part two of the Act is a statutory scheme which provides for compulsory adjudication in construction contracts. And that scheme brought about a fundamental change in the way that many construction disputes in this jurisdiction are resolved. A key reason for the scheme being introduced was in order to, to improve the speed with which construction disputes were resolved. Cash flow is the lifeblood of any business and nowhere is this more true than in the construction industry where there can be dozens of different subcontractors on a single project and the margins are often extremely low. The pace and cost of dispute resolution in the courts simply did not meet the requirements of some disputes. The principle behind adjudication, both the construction type and the one that we're talking about today, is that it is, quote, interim but binding, close quotes. In other words, the parties must comply with the decision and, for example, pay the monies that they've been ordered to pay. But each is entitled to take the dispute forward to the ordinary, more formal dispute resolution procedure, court or arbitration, in other words. Interestingly, however, in the construction context anyway, the evidence suggests that the proportion of disputes which do go on to a full hearing is relatively low. The Technology and Construction Court, the TCC, was and remains instrumental in ensuring that construction adjudication is an effective mechanism. They have done this both by ensuring streamlined and expedited procedures for enforcement, and by taking a clear and consistent line in decisions. In the early part of this century, there was a rash of cases whereby all manner of points were taken by imaginative barristers, generally by those who were resisting enforcement of the adjudicator's decision. The court's message was clear. Unless it can be shown that the adjudicator acted outside their jurisdiction or that there was a breach of natural justice, the adjudication decision would be enforced. There are now hundreds of adjudication decisions and probably dozens of leading cases establishing individual points of importance. But the upshot is that construction adjudication is now a well-established and hugely important part of the dispute resolution process in the construction industry. So turning now to the SEL scheme, which has relatively recently been introduced and which we're thinking about today. Now, unlike construction adjudication, this is not a statutory scheme. The parties may agree to the scheme in their contracts or on an ad hoc basis as disputes arise. Here, in the scenario that we're uh, considering, the parties have agreed that the scheme applies in their original contract, and they have used model A. 
which provides that any dispute arising under this agreement shall be referred to adjudication in accordance with the Society for Computers and Law Adjudication Rules, the SCLA rules, and no litigation or arbitration proceedings relating to that dispute may be commenced prior to the publication of the adjudicator's decision. Other models are also available. Uh, model B, which gives either party the option of adjudication, And model C, which provides that the parties may agree between themselves, which really is very little different from an ad hoc agreement, uh, which is entered into as a dispute arises, but it does at least put the adjudication process onto the party's radar. Under the rules, you start an adjudication by issuing a dispute notice. This has a prescribed length and format. It's two A4 pages, double-spaced. The contents of it are prescribed by rules three and four. Now, statutory construction disputes have no such page limits on the notice of intention to adjudicate. So, so that's a bit of a difference between the statutory scheme and the SCLA scheme. The rationale behind the page limit under the SCL scheme is to encourage the submission of a narrowly focused dispute that's capable of being decided fairly within the tight fixed timescales. Now, Ian is going to summarise the content of his client's dispute notice. Thank you, Matthew. Um, just going back to that set of rules three and four and bringing them back on screen you'll see that there are six prescribed matters under Rule 3 that a dispute notice shall cover. And as Matthew has explained, and this is covered in Rule 4, it's got to be kept really tight because it's got to be limited to two pages of A4. Now, the actual approach and style is not prescribed, but as a party, and here I'm acting for the claimant, we need to ensure that we tick off each of the things set out in paragraph three within the confines set by paragraph four. So bringing up on screen now, I've, I've got the draft dispute notice that my client has produced and you'll see a way of doing this. And if anything, it's, it's a little long. If I filled out all the square brackets, we might tip over the two page limit, but it, it gives you a flavor of how punchy these sorts of documents need to be. Um, so just, rattling through and just making sure that I've covered off each of those prescribed matters. Um, I take them out of sequence. I introduce the parties at two and then three, setting out their contact details, their addresses, external representatives. Um, then the agreement to adjudicate, that's covered at paragraph four. And you'll see that there's a reference to Annex One, which um, is required because you need under rule 3.1, to attach evidence of the agreement to adjudicate. Um, next, the dispute. Uh, this is summarized between paragraphs five and eight. And as you will have seen from rule 3.3, this needs to be an expression of the dispute in neutral terms, showing its nature, its scope, uh, and include its approximate value. And because this is a scheme that's really targeted at technology disputes, there's a further requirement to explain the nature of the technology or the technical solution involved in the dispute. And this is important because it's a way of communicating to the SCL chairman, who is going to nominate an adjudicator, who would be suitable as your party's adjudicator. Um, the difficulty here on these facts, as you see as we scroll through the dispute notice is that essentially the respondent hasn't engaged in any particular detail with, with the complaints that, being, that is being made. As Matthew said at the outset, this is a licensing dispute and it turns on uh, essentially this, the restrictions imposed by the contract on how the, the license is to be used. Uh, and there are issues as to numbers of workstations and this proper construction of that, and also location, um, and the extent to which those terms have been breached. 
if the claimant happens to be correct in its interpretation. Uh, and scrolling through, you'll see the way that that dispute is set out. Turning to the last of the paragraphs in this dispute notice, paragraph nine, this is where, in accordance with rule 3.5, we have the, the claimant communicating to the SEL club chairman who would be appropriate to resolve this dispute. Uh, and here, a legally qualified person would be appropriate, but should you have a more technical dispute, you could say that a more technical, non-legally qualified person should sit as adjudicator. Stepping back, this is a long-term contractual relationship and one that my client would very much like to preserve. So its hope through adjudication is to get a quick decision on a contentious issue that will hopefully settle an area of dispute and allow the contractual relationship to be reset. So that's a whistle-stop tour through my dispute notice. You'll notice that Ian's client is claiming costs. Fighting a three month adjudication obviously comes at a cost, albeit one that's likely to be much lower than a standard arbitration or court case. And by default under rule 40, the adjudicator has the power to order some or all of the reasonable costs incurred by the other party in relation to the adjudication. And this is one matter where the SCL scheme is distinguishable from statutory construction adjudication where costs are not recoverable. However, under the SCL scheme, if the parties choose, they can also adopt that position. In other words, they can decide at the outset that there won't be any jurisdiction for costs. SCL fees are payable on commencement of the adjudication, but they're limited to 500 pounds. There are no other administration fees payable as the adjudication progresses. And the idea here is that the process should be cost effective, even for the smaller disputes, and also simple. We have no sliding scale of fees that increases with claim value, such as one might find at certain arbitration institutions. Now, the adjudicators and experts have fees as well, and we're going to come back to that. The claimant has also sought interest under Rule 33, which you will hopefully be able to see on the screen now. The adjudicator may award the payment of simple or compound interest on any amounts found due from one party to another, the rates period and basis being in the adjudicator's discretion. And this is another distinctive feature of the scheme. Under statutory construction adjudication schemes, unless the parties agree, interest doesn't fall within an adjudicator's jurisdiction. Yes, the drafting committee felt that the, um, this default position better reflected the commercial expectations of typical parties to technology disputes. Now, enough about costs. Turning to the substance, there's no restriction on the size or scope of technology dispute that can be referred to this scheme for adjudication, provided that the matter is capable of resolution within the maximum three calendar month period for the adjudicator to make a decision. And I should make that clear, that three calendar months is not just for the submissions, it's also for the adjudicator to make his decision or her decision. Subject to hearing from the respondent, this uh, adjudication, this licensing dispute that Ian has referred, seems to be suitable as a referral. And the next step is that within three working days of the dispute notice, a response notice must be served. Again, this is limited to two A4 pages. It should identify the areas of disagreement, and if there is one, it should set out briefly the counterclaim. And Laura will now summarise the content of her client's notice. Thanks, Simon. Um, as Simon has just flagged, the requirements for a response notice are set out in Rule 6, which you should be able to see on the slides. They are largely the same um, as for the dispute notice. Um, and really what these rules are driving at is that the respondent is required to set out its position and state whether it um, agrees or disagrees with the, with the claimant in respect to the matters raised in the dispute notice. Now I'll leave the audience to have a look at the response notice in more detail, but I will just flag some key tactical points that the respondent should bear in mind. If there are any jurisdictional objections, a respondent will want to take these as soon as possible and to raise them in the response notice. 
In this case, however, there is a clear adjudication clause and there's very little advantage um, to my client arguing that a dispute hasn't arisen. The respondent here simply wants a prompt resolution. As with the dispute notice, there's no prescribed style for this statement of case, but it must be kept within two pages. And the main attraction of, of the kind of abridged pleading that uh, the respondent has adopted here is that it should make both the areas of dispute and agreement clear. The identification of the party's differences is the primary objective of the response. It's also open to the respondent to bring a counterclaim um, and if they're going to do so, brief details of the counterclaim are required. By rule 14, any counterclaim that doesn't arise from the contract or alternatively subject matter to which the original dispute relates will not be considered by the adjudicator. Here, my client, the respondent's counterclaim is closely connected, so that won't be a problem. It introduces more technical issues, which the SCL scheme is well suited to resolve. So I'll leave the audience to read the response notice in detail, but just to flag up some of the key arguments made by the respondent and the approach adopted, um, you'll see that the response notice um, addresses relevant paragraphs of the dispute notice. Um, we have agreed to adjudicate under the SCLA rules. And just to touch on some of the key arguments, um, you'll see at paragraph four that the claimant's construction of clause four is denied. Our key argument is that design module usage was not restricted to a geographical location or by individual users. Instead, the usage was limited to five workstations wherever located in simultaneous use. The number of automated sewing machines able to use the manufacturing mod module was based on warranted software performance. Accordingly, at paragraph six, the respondent says that there is therefore no relevant breach of contract or copyright infringement. And the respondent also counterclaims for damages as a consequence of the claimant's breach of clause two. And in a real response notice, uh, the sum claimed would be set out there. Thanks, Laura. So it's the dispute notice and the response notice which define the adjudicator's jurisdiction for the dispute. The adjudicator is not, does not have the power to do anything that is not contained in those notices. And that is certainly in the construction context has been quite a, a fruitful area of um, judicial decision. The adjudicator should then be appointed within five working days. One of the distinctive features of the scheme is that there is a pre-selected panel uh, of adjudicators uh, for those interested in becoming an adjudicator, there are three routes uh, to qualification for the legally qualified, for the non-legally qualified and for other equivalents. All applicants must uh, complete an application form, provide two referees and sign a declaration. Uh, applications are assessed to ensure candidates meet the required eligibility standards and appointment is then approved by the members of the SCL Board of Trustees. Uh, the aim is to ensure disputes are resolved by individuals with genuine expertise and experience. The current panel is shown on the slide. Uh, it is kept under regular review. Uh, there are, these are all uh, tech professionals like Simon uh, with considerable experience uh, of both technology and dispute resolution matters. Uh, with limited exceptions, adjudication fees are capped at £450 an hour. And as you've seen, uh, the dispute notice and response notice should express a preference on the type of adjudicator to guide the SCL chairman's nomination. And on our scenario, Terry is nominated by the SCL chairman, assuming for present purposes that he's on the panel. Um, the parties, of course, have the right to choose a different adjudicator from the panel within two working days, but sensibly in this case, they do not do so. And so Terry is appointed. So, We've had a dispute notice and we've had a response. We have an adjudicator. The next stage of proceedings is the submission of statements of case. And this is covered by rules 18 to 23, which are now on screen. Look at the timing here. These rules provide for a turnaround time of one month for the submission of all statements of case. That's pretty short. 
And it's deliberately so. It's consistent with the objective of facilitating a prompt resolution of disputes. And it also keeps costs under control. The parties need to keep their pleadings short and to the point. That's not just because of the limited time. There's also an express 10 page limit on the length of each statement of case. Continuing the theme of keeping short and to the point, supporting documentation can be submitted with the statements of case, but only key documents that are directly relevant to the issues in dispute can be submitted. Supporting documents for each pleading are also limited to one file. Now, as you'll see from rule 23, there is scope for the parties to adjust by agreement these kinds of limits. So if they take a view that sensibly some kind of uh, softening of these rules is required for their particular dispute, it can happen. And let's say, for example, in our dispute, the contract itself and its full schedules exceed a file all by themselves. Well, Laura and I might agree that this won't contribute to the file limits on the supporting documents. Now, turning to my statements of case, this is the opportunity for my client, the claimant, to flesh out the notice, identify and quote the specific provisions it relies on, and offer its own interpretation. This is no longer a document that needs to be expressed neutrally, like the dispute notice. This is an opportunity to be much more adversarial. Um, I'll also need in this statement of case to identify the facts that the claimant relies upon and I'll cross refer to the supporting documents. And as with a construction adjudication, I may include within my prescribed file of supporting documents, things like witness statements and expert reports. So on receipt of the claimant statement of case, the respondent then has 10 working days to serve its response and counterclaim. In this case, I am concerned that the 10 page limit is in fact too short because of the vast number of defects that need to be particularized. There are of course different ways to deal with this. Um, for example, I could rely more on cross references to the underlying expert report. However, what my solicitors and I choose to do in this case is to ask the adjudicator via email for an additional 10 pages. So I reviewed that request and invite brief written comments from the claimant. And in response, my instructing solicitors produce an email which says that they object. Uh, the scheme has this limit for a good reason, and there's nothing particularly exceptional about either the claim or the counterclaim to justify a departure. I take that objection into consideration, together with the submissions and the evidence so far, and decide to hold the respondent to the standard limits, saying I will review whether the further submissions are required or on closure of the statements of case and the respondent will have liberty to apply. Five working days after the response and counterclaim is served, the claimant serves its response to counterclaim and reply. After five further working days, the respondent serves its reply. At the end of this uh, stage of the proceedings, I have four brief statements of case, the contract file, and just under four further files of supporting material. I now consider further directions for the adjudication. The adjudication process is designed to be flexible. And under Rule 25, the adjudicator has broad powers which may be exercised on application or on his or her own initiative. Here's a non-exhaustive list of powers uh, you see as set out in the rules. One of the features you may note is that the adjudicator can be proactive and has some latitude as to how the adjudication is conducted. An adversarial approach can be taken or, if appropriate, the approach can be more inquisitorial. And if construction adjudication is anything to go by, this allows for an increased tendency towards hearings or meetings, um, if there are to be such uh, events held, where the adjudicator tends to drive the questions rather than allowing cross-examination. However, there's no requirement either way. It should depend on what the dispute requires. Under Rule 25.8, the adjudicator may obtain specialist advice from consultants or experts on technical matters. And under 25.9, a non-lawyer adjudicator can seek input from a lawyer on the SCL adjudication panel or otherwise. 
in all cases, uh, the third party advisor obviously needs to be conflict free. And again, there is a limit on fees. They're capped at uh, £450 per hour as a maximum. As I've already said, one of the aims of the scheme is to achieve speedy and cost effective outcomes. To that end, Rule 16 imposes an obligation on the adjudicator to conduct the procedure in a timely and cost effective manner and to avoid unnecessary expense. So these imperatives should inform the adjudicator's conduct of the entire adjudication process. In a timely and cost effective manner, I have reviewed the position for this adjudication. There are three key areas where I believe further assistance is required. The first is proper construction of clauses four and five. The second is the alleged defects in the manufacturing module. And the third is how such defects are said to have caused the respondent to have to uh, lease and operate the new machines. I have notified the parties uh, and asked them to arrange a short preliminary meeting by Zoom uh, to discuss the directions, uh, including any proposals they may have on these or other material issues. Sir, thank you very much for convening this meeting. Uh, Ms. Wright and I have discussed the issues between ourselves and we as parties have come up with an agreed proposal for the first and third areas, but we have rival submissions on the third. On the proper construction of clauses four and five, subject to your approval, my learned, and friend, my learned friend and I propose to serve further written submissions and then arrange for a one hour hearing to address any questions you may have. Given COVID, we suggest that's held like this meeting via Zoom. I agree, an oral hearing would be helpful. I do not need much uh, more in writing from the parties uh, on this. However, I will give permission to serve a maximum of five pages of skeletal submissions uh, to support your oral advocacy two days before the hearing. Do either of you have further comments on this? None from the claimant. No, so you have our proposed dates. Yes, so let's fix the hearing for Friday in a fortnight. Uh, the claimant is to circulate meeting details three working days beforehand. How about the alleged defects in the manufacturing uh, module issue? Miss Wright, that, that's your case to prove. Uh, what are the respondents' proposals? So the parties have both relied upon experts' reports. Yeah, but they're diametrically opposed. Uh, we propose that as a first step, the experts agree a joint statement that will hopefully narrow the issues. Looking at the reports, as you say, we should still anticipate significant disagreement. The rules do allow for you to seek further specialist advice from another expert. We suggest that that is probably unnecessary. Um, I propose instead that you have the opportunity to question the experts. Arrangements could be made for this if you decided that this was the right course. And what do you say about that, Mr. Monroe? The claimant agrees to these proposals, but we consider that there is an intermediate step before any joint statement. As you will have seen, most of the respondents' complaints concern the interaction between the manufacturing module and the performance of the physical machinery. Now, having considered the software, the claimant's expert has opined that there are likely to have been maintenance issues rather than any particular coding errors. However, of course, she's not had the opportunity to inspect the machinery or see it in operation. To that end, we submit there should be a joint inspection by the experts at the respondent's factory, followed by a joint statement. Well, I see the force in that, uh, but presumably there are practical concerns, Ms. Wright? So the respondent's primary position is that the claimant has had ample opportunity to inspect and indeed to correct these defects. I point out that they were notified six months ago um, but if you are minded to direct that there should be an inspection, then yes, as you say, there are some practical concerns, including how we are to proceed in a COVID safe manner. Well, we have six further weeks to play with, uh, if needs be, including the time for my decision. Um, that offers some flexibility, which may be important, uh, because as we all know, the position on COVID changes daily. I would like both parties to liaise with their experts to see to what extent they can perform the inspection remotely via video conferencing. We have asked, sir, and this is likely to be challenging, 
Um, I suggest that the experts attend in person with strict social distancing and with other precautions observed um, together with one of the respondents employees who will be able to operate the equipment as directed. I also propose that everyone else joins via video conference uh, supported by a camera operator. Of course, uh, you could join or otherwise review the video record. Ms. Monroe, any comments? No, sir, that all sounds acceptable to us. With one caveat, of course, liberty to apply for further directions if the position changes. I will direct that an on-site inspection should take place the week after next, as I described. Uh, I would like to join and ask that the parties propose dates within the next few days. I direct that the experts in consultation with their instructing parties shall circulate an agenda five working days beforehand. Insofar as issues are anticipated to arise, for example, due to changes in COVID regulation or a dispute over the agenda, uh, the claimant should apply for further directions as soon as possible. After the inspection, the experts will then have five working days to produce a joint statement. I will then review the position and consider whether a video conference with the experts is required. If so, I will make further directions. Now, the third area. Yes, sir, so you've asked how the alleged defects are said to have caused the respondent to lease and operate those new machines. And this obviously is an issue that the claimant has raised in its response to counterclaim and reply. The claimant requested disclosure of specific categories of documents in regard to this issue, and happily, the respondent has agreed to that. The list was emailed yesterday. Sir, do you have it? I do, and that seems like a sensible way forward. Uh, Miss Wright, your solicitor's emailed the list. I assume the respondent is in agreement. Yes, it is. Anything else? Uh, there is, sir. Uh, um, as you know, on the respondent's interpretation of Clause 4, use of the design module is limited to five workstations in simultaneous use, wherever they may be. Now, the claimant has provided a witness statement from Mr Z. Uh, which asserts that he has monitored usage and on occasions up to seven workstations were using the module simultaneously. We don't accept that the exhibited screenshot is sufficient evidence. The respondent's position on this is that we don't say it's inadmissible but we want access to the underlying database to inspect. What do you say Ms Monroe? The claimant's concern is essentially that offering remote access to the whole database is going to be problematic because it contains confidential information. So may I make a suggested compromise? Uh, the claimant gives access via screen share that it controls and is attended by the witness whose evidence is challenged, uh, a legal representative from each party and the experts. It could be recorded so that I can review as necessary. Well, subject to standard confidentiality agreements being signed, that sounds acceptable for the court. Well, Mr Monroe, Rule 44 does provide that by default, the adjudication procedure and all documents produced in relation thereto, including my decision, are and shall remain confidential. However, would the respondent agree to that additional safeguard? I'm just waiting for instructions to come on screen. Uh, we'd want to see the actual agreement, um, but we can agree in principle to this and the compromise position that you've suggested. Good. Could, please could the parties draw up uh, directions uh, in line with what we've discussed. Uh, I am happy to deal with any consequential matters via email. Thank you both. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So that was a productive meeting and I think it showcases some of the flexibility offered by uh, the rules. Of course, there's always scope for non-compliance with directions. And rule 26, which I hope is on your screens now, provides for the consequences and just sets out that if a party fails without sufficient justification to comply with the SELA rules, including any directions or timetable set by the adjudicator, the adjudicator may draw inferences as he or she sees fit and continue with the adjudication and proceed to make the decision notwithstanding any such failures. And there is also an obligation on the parties under Rule 17 to act in good faith throughout the adjudication procedure. Let's assume that the adjudication proceeds in accordance with Mr. Bergen's directions. 
So what's going to happen? Oral submissions on the construction of the contract are heard. The inspection takes place. The joint statement's prepared. And the adjudicator can't help himself. And he decides he does want to exercise his power to speak to the experts himself. The inspection uh, happens without a hitch. Disclosure of documents relating to the leasing and operation of the automated sewing machines, well, that was more problematic. The initial disclosure requests were met. However, they gave rise to a further discreet request, which was resisted, and the adjudicator ordered further disclosure. The respondent failed to comply with that further disclosure order. The adjudicator now comes to make his decision. So we've already discussed the overall three month limit and a decision made after that would fall outside of the adjudicator's jurisdiction. And that three month deadline is a backstop for the process. Uh, adjudicators are encouraged, encouraged to expedite the procedure wherever possible uh, and deliver their decision at the earliest opportunity. Under rules 31 and 32, which I hope you can now see on the screen, the decision shall be in writing and provide reasons. The adjudicator must take into account relevant information and also disclose information that was not taken into account which, and which was not provided by the parties. Uh, references made to third party advisors under rules 25.8 and 25.9. Where evidence is not provided by the parties, natural justice issues may arise. Uh, an adjudicator will naturally want to give the parties an opportunity to comment upon it. I'm going to skip over the reasoning, which is in depth and considerable, uh, and here are the bullet points in my decision. The terms of the license do not restrict usage to a particular geographical location or the identity of the users, except that they must be employed by or be directors of the respondent. Subject to any changes in accordance with the contract, the number of workstations simultaneously using the design module is restricted to five, and the number of machines using the manufacturing module is fixed at two. The respondent has breached the terms of the license and infringed copyright by having upwards of seven workstations simultaneously using the design module regularly throughout the working day over the last eight months, and five machines using the manufacturing module. The manufacturing module is materially defective, seriously affecting performance. I accept that, having notified the claimant at, and the defects not having been fixed, it was reasonable for the respondent to uh, supplement the number of machines. I do not accept that the leasing and operation of all the new machines was caused by the defects. Doing the best I can and drawing adverse inferences as a result of limited disclosure I hold that the loss and damage represents uh, the costs associated with the leasing and operation of one machine. I cannot make the declaration sought as to ongoing leasing and operation costs, as there may be debate about when and how the defects are sufficiently resolved. However, it is now common ground that they cannot be resolved within a month. So I award costs for one machine until the date falling a month after this decision as to damages. I calculate that at X pounds. In terms of the license fee, I find and declare that monthly fees for two additional workstations and two additional automated sewing machines should be paid from March 2018 and on an ongoing basis and less than until there is a further change of usage in accordance with the contract terms. It is not reasonable to charge license fees for the machine required as a result of the claimant's breaches. Taking into account the counterclaim, the respondent shall pay to the claimant Y pounds in debt, or if I am wrong about this, damages for unpaid license fees to date. The claimant is entitled to Z pounds in interest on the principal figure of Y pounds calculated in the attached schedule. As the claimant is the receiving party, I find in principle that it is entitled to its costs. However, I take into account that a substantial amount of time and cost was spent on the defects during this, uh, during this adjudication, an issue on which I found in the respondent's favour. A fair allowance for this is 25%, and as such I decide the claimant is entitled to 75% of its reasonable costs. In accordance with Rule 40, I will make a subsequent decision 
on the amount of costs after receiving submissions in relation to that question. On receipt of that gratifying decision, we as parties have three working days to review it and notify the adjudicator if there are any minor clerical or typographical errors. I notice that the license fee contains a clerical error which is notified by those instructing me. I review this and agree. I issue a revised decision. It does not change the paying party. In that case, both parties accept the decision and we, the respondent, pay up. If the parties had acted differently and been unsatisfied with Mr Bergen's decision, either party will be free to commence litigation or arbitration, depending on the DR clause in their contract. However, if they want to litigate or arbitrate the matters referred to the adjudicator, they have to do so within six calendar months of the effective date of the decision, and that's five working days after the decision is sent by email and secure post to the parties. Because if they don't uh, litigate or arbitrate within six calendar months, they lose the right to do so. And in the meantime, even if they do intend to go to some further dispute resolution procedure, the parties have to comply with the decision. If they don't, uh, the claimant would be able to apply to enforce the decision in court immediately upon the effective date of the decision. Uh, and the decision itself, all submissions and evidence may be submitted to the court or arbitral tribunal by, other, uh, by either party. If the decision is not challenged within the six month period, the scheme provides that it becomes final and binding for all purposes. So I'd like to end by summarizing and reiterating some of the key advantages of the scheme. First, it's squarely aimed at the needs of technology disputes and it's designed to be fast and cost effective. And that's all ingrained in the rules and the time limits on submissions and the length limits on evidence. Two, the adjudicators on the adjudicator panel are selected from experts in the field and are therefore well placed to resolve disputes justly. Three, the scheme is flexible. Adjudicators have wide ranging powers that they can apply to the particular demands of the case, as we've seen here with Mr Bergen. We look forward to answering any questions you might have about the scheme at a live event. Right, so I, I'm going to uh, start by repeating the answer I gave earlier on other jurisdictions. It's, um, it's absolutely right that the, the, the current scheme envisages uh, English court um, enforcement and therefore is effectively an English scheme. However, there's no reason in principle it can't also work in Scotland and in Ireland, subject obviously uh, to uh, changing the jurisdiction clauses. Uh, certainly, um, I, I have had conversations with people uh, in both jurisdictions, probably Scotland, we've moved a little bit further than we have with Ireland, but certainly the, the hope is that we can set up equivalent, um, well, it's not really equivalent schemes, it's, uh, we, we can make sure we have the rules in place and the procedures in place uh, to have Scottish jurisdiction uh, adjudications and Irish jurisdiction uh, adjudications as well on precisely the same basis. And um, we, we just need to make sure that uh, the courts will be happy to enforce sufficiently as and when required. Uh, I don't foresee any problems, uh, but um, we are speaking with those with the relevant local expertise. Uh, David Eastwood has asked, many of the big software vendors and big tech companies are outside the UK, which is obviously right. Will this be a break on uptake? Uh, I mean, my, my immediately thoughts, I mean, obviously don't know, uh, but I don't see in principle that should be the case because, well, firstly, uh, many of the big vendors and tech companies uh, with UK business have UK subsidiaries and are fully invested in the UK market, including uh, the way in which the UK does its disputes. Uh, you know, they, uh, they litigate in the uh, English courts, they have English seated arbitrations. Uh, so why not this? Uh, the other point, of course, is that uh, what I certainly hope will happen over time is that you'll get client side demand for these adjudication clauses in contracts. 
Uh, and so it's not exclusively down uh, to the tech companies to choose uh, whether or not, well, I mean, ultimately you never have to agree a contract, uh, but, but um, I, I would hope the position will be, this will be something you would, uh, on the client side, will be uh, sought in a negotiation. And, you know, as part of uh, whatever commercial deal is done, uh, I would assume that, at least in the, in the right contexts, uh, even uh, companies who would not naturally be inclined to subject themselves to this sort of process will be prepared to give it a go. Uh, now, looking at it sort of through a slightly more positive prism, if you are a big tech implementer or outsource provider, uh, you probably spend a lot of money on tech disputes in amongst other places, this jurisdiction. And I would hope that many would welcome a more efficient and cost-effective way of dealing with some types of those disputes. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, I agree with all of that. And I suppose the other factor that, that, that plays in here is that um, even if the uh, tech company is, is based abroad, sort of by definition, this contract will be one which is governed by English law, because otherwise, uh, you know, it's unlikely to have any connection with this jurisdiction. So if it does have it, that sufficient connection, either through um, operation of, of law or just or, or through choice of law more, more commonly then uh, in a sense they've crossed the rubicon of of subjecting themselves to the english legal system and so perhaps they'd be more sympathetic to it yeah uh now uh thank you for that simon I mean, the next question was from uh, anonymous attendee uh, and i assume that means uh, someone who is anonymous rather than someone who has that rather extraordinary name, anonymous attendee. Uh, but the question is a good one, which is, do you think the rules are suitable to be used or adapted to provide binding outcomes, i.e. Uh, expert determination effectively? Now, uh, it's quite, quite an interesting that because uh, in a way, if you go for expert determination, i.e. binding outcome rather than temporary finality, uh, you're almost wrenching out uh, the, the sort of heart of the the concept. That said, uh, the answer is a resounding yes. And actually, I can't remember whether they're on the site or not, but we've actually drafted a version of the model clause, which does provide for exactly that, because there are a number of people actually who say, well, actually, we want expert determinations, but we quite like your rules because it gives some structure to it. Uh, can we do that? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, and that there are really only two things that are required for the answer to that to be yes. One is, as this is a contractual process, obviously that's what the parties have to agree, and if they agree it, well, fine. So the only other remaining question is, if you agree that, will the SCL be prepared to provide uh, an adjudicator, well, an expert in that case, through the panel? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, we will, that's fine. Uh, and I that there's a broader point here, which is within reason, it's always open to parties to adopt the SCLA rules for their disputes, but mm -hmm. modify them in some way. Uh, and provided the modifications are not outlandish uh, or, or objectionable, uh, then I see no bar to nonetheless using the scheme, using the SCL chairman to provide an expert adjudicator, whoever, via the panel. Uh, and all that's happened is the parties have contractually agreed a modified set of the rules. There, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, just to, just to build on that, of course, the overall purpose of adjudication, both construction and, and this one, is, is to give, as Matthew says, temporary finality. Um, it, 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 certainly in the construction context, I think parties often want to have uh, the, the get out clause, if you like, of being able to challenge things in due course, uh, because, you know, adjudicating can get it wrong, it can be quite a rushed um, uh, experience in, turn, in comparison to litigation and so forth. But what the scheme does is provides quite a, you know, comparatively strict uh, limitation period, really, which is you've got to get going within six months. Um, now, the parties, I dare say, can, um, can, can, can override that if they wanted to. But of course, what that does mean is that if you get a decision that you're not happy with, you need to get a bit of a shift on. Um, but equally, if you uh, uh, if you're if you're if you're happy with it, 
you, you do achieve finality relatively soon, certainly compared to ordinary limitation periods. Uh, so another one from David Eastwood. Uh, the scheme's been up for a year or so. What uptake has there been so far? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm both um, horrified and relieved that you've asked that question. Um, horrified because it means I'm going to have to answer and say, actually, there, as far as I'm aware, haven't yet been any adjudications under the scheme. Uh, but I, I'm pleased you've asked the question because I'm going to tell you why. I, there have been a lot of, uh, there's definitely been a lot of interest and we've heard a lot of, um, albeit anecdotal, um, requests from parties to find out more about the scheme, whether they can use it in an ad hoc context, answer yes, it's, uh, or, or use model C, um, but nobody wants to be the first. And so we, we have had a bit of a bootstrapping problem, persuading someone uh, to be the first. Uh, but, but the point is, it's a little bit silly because it's not, it's not so radical. Uh, people are quite happy to put expert determination clauses in their contracts. And uh, necessarily, if that, that's an ad hoc scheme, you're going to be the first, right, <laughs> for those contractual schemes you're agreeing all the time. Um, so really, someone needs to just sort of cross the Rubicon and not think of it as something radically new, different and a voyage into the unknown, but to see it for what it is, uh, which is a... Uh, 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 actually a safer version of doing expert determination because you've got the fullback of litigation if you need it because of the temporary finality uh, w with a set of rules and a pre-vetted panel uh, what one may ask is not to like. Uh, I, I think it's also fair to say though that although it, in technical terms the scheme has been up and running for, for a year it hasn't really uh, because um, we, we sort of, it, it was a drip feed start. We sort of wrote the rules and had a bit of a splash launch uh, before we had any panelists. So I mean, it, it has been going for several months, but I don't think it's been going for, for quite a year yet. Uh, but um, David, please, please do um, persuade those uh, for whom you do expert work that this is definitely the scheme uh, that they, they should be signing up to. Presumably, sorry, and you carry on. I was just going to say that presumably, given this is something that the parties may choose to put into contracts now, inevitably there's going to be a bit of a lag before those contracts fall apart and they need the help of the scheme. Yeah, I was, I was going to make the same point. I, I think that although the scheme is designed so that parties can, can adopt it on an ad hoc basis, I think it's more likely that it, it, if, if it gains proper traction and the sort of traction we'd like it to, it's because uh, it's written into dispute resolution um, clauses um, because I think it's quite difficult for parties particularly with a new procedure a dispute say a dispute now arises with all the challenges that everyone faces in the workplace and someone says well let's try this new scheme you know even though we're in dispute with you and all the rest of it let's agree to try something new it's not impossible of course but I suspect it's more likely that what needs to happen is that this needs to become an, a, 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 an inclusion in uh, dispute resolution resolution clauses, and I suspect that will take a bit of time to filter through. Uh, no, that, that's actually a, a very good point, and um, of course we don't know, and we have no way of knowing whether uh, and if so the extent to which people are using these clauses in their contracts. Uh, that that will take several years to filter through potentially. Um, uh, Clive um, makes quite an interesting point in the chat which is the very existence of the scheme might perhaps have helped parties achieve a negotiated outcome. Uh, again, we, we have no data on that, but it is conceptually possible uh, because um, the Damocletian sword of a dispute resolution procedure, which might actually get an adverse result in a very short time period, focuses minds in, in a way that the can kicking of litigation doesn't. Do you think there's a danger in overemphasizing sort of the novelty of this procedure sometimes? Because the truth is as lawyers, Simon, myself, I'm sure but most of the people on the panel have either done numerous adjudications in a construction context or expert determination. So reading these kinds of rules feels like kind of bread and butter rather than, you know, voyage into the unknown. Yeah, I think that's right. It's, it, for those of us, and, and certainly in, in, in Four Point Court, where, where, where all the panel's from on, on this tour, who many of us do a lot of construction and IT work. This, this is just a natural extension of, of a system that by and large has worked extremely well for the last 
couple of decades. Uh, I agree with that. I mean, the difference with it, of course, it is that it, it's contractual, not statutory. But um, but in terms of in terms of being frightened by it, I absolutely agree with you. But I mean, to be fair, I, I think exactly the same happened twenty odd years ago for, in the construction industry. Hmm. I mean, everyone was very wary of it. I mean, they had no choice but to do it. But they were very wary of it. They didn't like the idea. Um, it had a very negative vibe around it, uh, and that completely turned around. Yeah, absolutely. It took a few years for the for the main for any important decisions to come before the TCC, and 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 I think Fast Track, I seem to remember, was Fast Track uh, in front of uh, Mr. Justice Dyson, as he then was, um, was one of the early ones, and then it just just snowballed from there. But, but that has the advantage that a lot of the issues that might arise have been addressed. So it's, it's a known product. Yeah. The, the litigation of the new scheme has happened. Sorry, just to chip in. Um, I've been recommending the scheme in actually some lower value cases that might ordinarily end up in the county courts. And just stressing the benefit that you do. Well, I, I would much rather take my chances with um, an experienced adjudicator who's steeped in tech disputes than a county court judge who may be quite daunted by the um, subject matter. So it may be that we start off with some sort of less glamorous, less high value cases, if anyone sort of bites on that front. I, that, that's a very interesting thought. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And of course you've got, uh, although on the one hand you don't pay your judge, whereas you would have to pay the adjudicator, the fact that the, the scheme timescale is so tight uh, means that there's likely the, the natural cost saving on the party legal side probably means that at the very least it, it sort of balances out, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. No, I think that's a really excellent point because, you know, that that is exactly that sort of dispute that can be very painful to take through the county court process, uh, cost wise, time wise, and you know the the, the county uh, many county court judges just quite understandably don't have the experience now as very well made point. I, Lee's question, uh, yeah. have we taken, obtained any observations from members of the judiciary in relation to the scheme? Uh, and then there's a comment, it has the potential to save some court time resources to a degree, as well as the time and cost saving to the parties. Uh, in terms of the comment, I completely agree with you. In terms of the question, the answer is yes, but I don't think I can say more than that. Well, it's it's right to recall, as I'm sure um, many people will, that um, Mr. Justice Fraser, who was then the head of the TCC, very kindly came along to um, announce the launch of the scheme um, as well. So, you know, they're well aware of the scheme um, yes. and, uh, you know, one would one would hope pretty supportive of it. I, I one uh, thought that, well, uh, we, we sort of generally have been thinking about the scheme for what we might call core tech disputes. Um, so, you know, the, the project implementations, outsourcing, etc. Uh, there's a, and maybe this is one um, for you actually, Laura, or you possibly, Terry, which is um, what about for IT, uh, IP type disputes in the tech sector, so licensing disputes, that sort of thing, suitable or not? I can't see why not. Um... Yeah, I, think uh, I, would thought that, I would have thought that, uh, as with tech work, there will be tranches, some uh, disputes entirely suitable, others perhaps not, but there, there would definitely be a place for it. I mean, there are quite a lot of disputes, aren't there, where um, people arguing over license terms for software, for example, yeah. uh, whether you know, things like user rights, concurrent users, that, that sort of issue, which comes yeah. up all the time, uh, they are very expensive and long-winded to fight. Eminent yeah, suitable. eminently suitable um, and very much the sort of thing that one sees day in and day out. I mean, it, it, although the subject matter is IP, really, it's a contract case. I guess in those circumstances, you'd be minded to choose a, a legally trained adjudicator as opposed to um, non-legally qualified. But because you've got that choice in the rules, it certainly accommodates those sorts of disputes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, 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 I mean, I can suppose, I mean, you might even have, it's quite an interesting one, because currently we've got the, the, the two options of the legally qualified or the sort of expert, and we have had in mind a technical expert, 
But actually, you, you might see if this sort of takes off for licensing type disputes, you might send certain disputes to a valuation expert. Yeah, and certainly in IP cases, that's, you know, one of the more difficult aspects to advise on is, is what's this, what is this worth? Um, especially in sort of, you know, hypothetical user context. So yeah, I think that would be really useful. Yeah, it might, might be as in litigation, it would be a two-stage process that you get your determination on liability and then get a determination on quantum, because uh, Laura knows far more about this than I do, but uh, quantum trials can be disproportionately expensive. Yeah, and the, the majority of them just settle um, for that reason. Um, that the party so there would be a, that would be a quick route through to getting uh, a settlement imposed. Yeah. So Ian asks, uh, in many IT disputes, the pleadings and evidence are voluminous. Well, I agree with that. Uh, what would you say to parties who are concerned about the tight page limits under the scheme? Uh, well, what I would say to them is um, welcome to the whole point. Now, the, it's the voluminous pleadings and exhibits and all that oh, rubbish, or, or all that vital material that causes uh, these disputes to become mammoth uh, sort of monsters in their own right. I mean, the discipline of forcing you to focus on the bits that actually matter, make the points that actually need to be made and not all the peripheral, uh, equally interesting, but there's vital material, uh, is I think an extremely good discipline. And it's one which is going to help keep the costs low and, and actually help, help keep everyone focused on what matters. But also, one is unlikely to be using this scheme for disputes that re involve reviewing the entire five year history of the project it's far more likely to be something self-contained, uh, which is more amenable to a short statement of what the dispute is and what the party's respective positions on that dispute is. Uh, does someone want to pick up uh, the other Ian's point about costs? And this is what we discussed on the video, actually. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to. I mean, uh, I think the scheme quite commercially recognises that actually costs are an important factor of a, of a dispute. And, given it runs for three months potentially, uh, those can still be substantial and therefore uh, the default is that costs are paid. But, but um, and that too can, can be a, a real pressure to being focused and dealing with the scheme sensibly. Uh, and as, uh, as Ian says, achieving a potentially an earlier settlement. And this links in fact with my earlier comment earlier question that we just ducked which is you know how does mediation work alongside this this adjudication scheme uh, and those of you who've read the guidance will see that actually adjudication adjudication and mediation can go hand in hand and you might find yourself with a mediator during this scheme and that mediator presumably will be highlighting that there could be an adverse cost outcome at the end when the the, the adjudicator makes the decision so why not settle now and make your own compromise you can live with? I, th I think that's right. I, and I think it's, I think it'll probably be quite common that people are considering mediation um, as well. Uh, sometimes it may have happened already, but, uh, uh, and it's because it failed that they go through more formal dispute resolution procedures. But I think it can work really well if you've got um, a, a relatively quick form of dispute resolution procedure going on, formal dispute resolution procedure like this one, adjudication, and the parties go into uh, mediation uh, knowing that that is the fallback position. I think that really can serve to focus the mind and I see no difficulty in those two processes um, running in parallel. Just Alternative, if, if you've important. launched an adjudication and have had some to, uh, backwards and forwards on it, you've got some insight into the way the adjudicator's thinking. Not full insight, but some insight, which of course can play quite heavily in a, a mediation going on at the same time before the decision's made. Yeah, good point. Uh, just, okay, moving on to another question. I mean, Richard, your, your question about what's being done to market the scheme uh, to the government. Uh, ve very much, I'm certainly conscious of that being very desirable. If you've got any ideas of um, how to do it, please do tell me, uh, or, or Caroline. Uh, the, 
Uh, a brilliant question about A4 binders and files. Uh, I mean, the, these rules uh, were put together before COVID hit and remote hearings were absolutely standard. The world seems to have changed radically over the last year. Uh, yeah, we've got to change the rules about A4 binders and files. You're absolutely right. Thank you for raising it. I will deal with that. I will personally undertake to deal with that. We need a rule change. No, it's a good point. But I think I think the rules do indicate a page number as well, don't they? So that uh, be they, they they do, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a question here: Will adjudicators be willing to agree a fixed fee in advance? Um, I, I don't think that's what the scheme provides, but it, I, I wouldn't see any difficulty with doing that. It seems to work well with mediation, although sometimes the mediation that it's a little bit clearer really how, how long a particular process is going to take so there might be there might be slightly different challenges there but I, I i i wouldn't see any difficulty with at least exploring that um opportunity i can't speak for any other um of the appointed adjudicators no i, I there might be a question about the stage in the process that that yeah. becomes possible and i think one would need to have a reasonable feel for how long it was likely to take and things like is there going to be a, a hearing um, uh, and so forth? So, I mean, but, but I think in principle, I don't see a difficulty with the parties um, asking that question. And I would certainly not anticipate that the SCL would would reject that out of hand. I mean, I can't speak I can't speak for the SCL admin or Matthew or anyone else, but I would have thought that that would be subject to a, a sensible conversation. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matthew, Simon, but I don't think there would be any objection to there being a tranched approach to fees whereby you agree the fees for the, for the first round of pleadings, for example, you then review and agree a fee for the next stage, you then review and agree the fee for the final stage. Uh, no, I, I don't see why not. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, that will be between the, the parties and yeah. uh, the, the, the relevant adjudicator, because um, in a sense, the SCL... Uh, isn't going to get involved in that sort of negotiation, I wouldn't have thought. But, but that may be a, a suck it and see approach there. If, if this is something that comes up time and time again, it may be that over time we can come up with some guidelines and more standardised approaches. Uh, but I think we'd need more data before we could safely do that. I mean, thinking about Laura's scenario where you have a relatively modest claim being brought through the scheme, obviously parties would be a bit wary of committing to it until they realised what an adjudicator's costs would be. Do you think there'd be an appetite on the part of the SCL to, to take sort of theoretical questions or questions that might be passed on generally to the panel so that the parties could decide whether this was going to be cost effective before committing? Yes, I, mean, I wonder how, how one would do it in practice. Uh, I suppose one thing you could do is, um, provided it was it, it, you known what the dispute was, what exactly the papers were going to be, yeah. what the issues were involved, um, I, I would have thought it wouldn't be beyond the wit of man for a, a general indication to be given. But, but really, I mean, Simon, you're a panellist. Yeah, I mean, I, as I say, I, I think that's that approach to things works uh, works well in mediation, um, and you know, you you know the the scope of things. It, there, there is a big difference in mediation, of course, which is that you're not providing a decision to people, so you're not actually producing something at the uh, at the end of the day or after the process, and 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 you know, the complexity of that would feed into it but I, I don't see I don't see a problem in in principle with exploring that and I think the parties you know could could just raise that and say that's that's the approach they wanted to take okay so, so we we have um two minutes left uh, so what one sentence from everyone um so uh, going clockwise round, so you're on, on my screen, so Ian first. <laughs> well, I hope that those who watch the videos recognise that it's actually a very flexible process, particularly as far as kind of evidence gathering is concerned. And, and in a time when everyone's used to doing you know, video conferences and things, I think it segues really well uh, with a scheme that's, that's aimed at being flexible. Thank you. Laura. 
Um, yeah, I think I just encourage those watching to bear it in mind. I think it's it's quite easy when a new case comes in to sort of go along the, the well-trodden path of litigation, but certainly, um, yeah, this has the potential to really revolutionize this, uh, this sort of dispute resolution um, in the same way that we saw in respect of construction disputes. So yeah, please just um, keep it in mind and hopefully we'll, we'll get it off the ground quite soon. Thank you. Terry. Uh, it seems to me that there are certain categories of dispute which one sees day in, day out, which are eminently suitable for this. This would be a very cost effective way of getting temporary finality. Um, so I, I endorse what Laura says, encourage people to use it. Let's get this thing going. Thank you. And Simon. Yeah, well, I echo all of that. Uh, and uh, I, I think just keep it in mind. Uh, I mean, it was, and certainly my experience, mediation didn't really get going until about 20 odd years ago um, when people started mediating and now it's an absolute commonplace and it, it, it has completely revolutionized um, the way in which disputes are resolved for, for all of us and um, this this has the potential to be this to be not quite as widespread obviously but to be a, an important additional um, tool available to anyone involved with resolving these sorts of disputes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, panellists. Thanks, Simon, for sorting out the tech for us. And thank you, everyone who's uh, logged in to listen. And please do use the scheme. Thanks, all. all right. Thank you.